New York City can be the world of opportunity in some areas, but that in other areas, it's very desolate. If anything, you can walk right across that bridge. And a couple of these guys here have never, never left the area. They spend a whole day selling drugs. It's like a psychological restraint. You're like locked in place. In the Bronx, there seems to be like the highest rate of, of many you know, social kind of challenges. A part of the reason why a lot of people are recidivating in such large numbers is because of the lack of skills. And so with no options necessarily, our younger people, they result to behaviors that are considered illegal. All they know is here. Some have never traveled out the borough. I was about 12 when I moved to the Bronx. And being in my neighborhood, like when you grow up, it's like you have to constantly fight your way in and out of the building. Going to jail is like the same thing. You come out and guess who's there when you get home? The same people who you were getting in trouble with. And the first thing you can think of is to do what you used to do. Like my favorite gun was the 22. I can keep a 22 in my back pocket and you would never know. You would think it was my wallet or something. Most people still have it on them. They walk around with guns in their pockets. I was a teacher on Rikers Island, a jail complex in New York City, for three years. There's a public high school on Rikers. I spent my time working with adolescent young men and really watching how so many young people who are full of potential, once they re-entered back into the community, hit with a lot of stop signs, closed doors, inability to find work, inability to go back to school, and unfortunately recycling back into the system and back into my classroom. There was a culinary arts class actually on Rikers that I recognized as an area where a lot of young people were really, really demonstrating creativity. It was also an industry that I know is an industry that is very receptive to hiring young people after release. And I started thinking a lot about how food can be that unifier, that connector, or really brings community together. One of the differences in, in the membership, what we've seen in New York, which we haven't seen so much in Toronto, is the, the number of organizations that are dealing with issues of uh, the American prison system and, and of recidivism. Uh, we have a number of members that are focusing on this topic and really making great inroads. And there was a sense that the conversation was starting to turn, that it wasn't enough just to sit idly by uh, and to let the system work itself out, but that in fact we could take action, we could be entrepreneurial. What we try to do with Drive Change is we really try and broaden access and exposure to opportunity to say, you know what, like, I can extend beyond my block corner. I can extend beyond New York City's boundaries. There is a limitless potential that exists within me. Well, this is the food truck rally, which happens every third Sunday for us. So it's great community. It's great community of other small businesses, other food trucks. It's really nice uh, customer base. Like them, I've been through the criminal justice system. I was a young man who was incarcerated at 19, and I did 12 and a half years in prison. Um, so I know what it's like to come home and being turned down on 20, 30 job interviews trying to look for a job. Our truck, which we are training, mentoring, and employing and empowering former incarcerated youth, is basically trying to open up doors because food doesn't have any restraint. So it's one of those industries that does not discriminate whatsoever, no matter what your criminal history or your past is. All these kids were talking about needing quality employment that could also teach transferable skills. This is the manifestation and realization of that. You know, there's nothing better than being able to watch someone in their element really thrive and really want to be pursuing and doing and growing in that moment. So for me to be up here and to be on here doing this is really, it's just, it really is such a remarkable translation of what I hoped it would be when I was thinking about it, you know, two years ago. For the guys like myself who love to cook, you know, you find some peace in that, right? If I had that when I was 16, you know, I probably wouldn't have been in as much trouble and I probably wouldn't have been 27 now, just now getting my life together. 
So you reinvest the money that's going into the prisons to maintain people being there into programs that offer vocational or technical kind of training. What Drive Change is doing is they're tackling a very specific angle to try to provide re-entry and employment prospects for these folks. And I think they'd be the first to acknowledge that it's not an end-all be-all solution for what is a, a really significant and systemic problem. But what they are doing is showcasing that we can bring functional business models, we can bring imagination, creativity and real impact if we start to tackle these problems with a little bit greater creativity and intent than perhaps we have been doing in the past. We're walking up to the third floor in the Osborne Association. In this area, participants come and they may learn something about construction. You offer those things to people, you will see a sharp decline in incarceration. And that money can be used to still contribute to public safety, right? Because if it takes 30 some odd thousand dollars a year or more to incarcerate a person per year, so someone can get an undergraduate degree for the same amount of money that the taxpayers are paying for the incarcerate somebody. And when it's done, it'll be welcoming for all of the people that come up here to learn and to grow. And we'll see in this environment a place where people can transform their lives.